Hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Bronwyn Bruden, and I'm the Director of Programs and Studies here at the Africa Center at the Atlantic Council. Welcome. I am pleased and honored to be joining the Century today in launching its new investigative report, Overt Affairs, How North Korean Businessmen Busted Sanctions in the Democratic Republic of Congo. This is an important and timely study with implications for global security and non-proliferation efforts. We only have an hour to discuss this study. In a moment, I will be handing over to Hilary Mossberg, who is Director of Illicit Finance Policy at the Century, to say a word of introduction on the Century and its, uh, at its work. Following her remarks, John Deloso will provide what he says will be a less than 10 minute overview of the report. Following John's introductions, we'll have a discussion with a really remarkable panel of experts. Darya Dolzolovskova, a North Korea expert, is a research analyst in the Proliferation and Nuclear Policy Program at Royal United Services Institute for Defense and Security Studies. Dr. Pierre Engelbert, an expert on the Democratic Republic of the Congo, is a senior fellow here at the Africa Center and also the H. Russell Smith Professor of International Relations at Pomona College. And finally, Flower Bear Anzaloni is an expert on the Congolese banking system and also co-founder and coordinator of the Filimbi Citizens Movement. As you can see, we have an extraordinary amount of expertise assembled here. Uh, and in addition to our speakers, I want to point out that we've had more than 300 RSVPs for this event. Many of you are, of course, also national security experts and wonderful speakers in your own right. We would love to hear from you. So I would encourage you please to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions and comments. We're going to be monitoring those inputs very, very closely throughout the conversation, and they'll help us to ensure that we're giving you the information that you would like to get out of this event. So that is our housekeeping complete. On behalf of the Africa Center, a very warm welcome to you once again, and it's my pleasure to introduce Hilary Mossberg of the Century. Thanks, Hilary. Thank you, Bronwyn. Uh, my name is Hilary Mossberg. I'm the Director of Policy at the Century. Um, the Century is a, an investigative and policy team that follows illicit finance networks connected to war criminals and war profiteers. And we seek to shut those benefiting from violence out of the international financial system. We were co-founded in 2016 by George Clooney and John Pendergast, and we are an initiative of the Clooney Foundation for Justice. Since we launched, we've focused our efforts to create significant financial consequences for illicit actors, and we're currently focused on the Democratic Republic of Congo, Sudan, South Sudan, and the Central African Republic. We publish investigative reports, like the one you're going to hear about today, on covering corruption, human rights abuses, illicit finance, sanctions violations, and our policy arm works closely with policymakers, law enforcement, global banks, and the private sector entities around the world. Our work has led to asset freezes, travel bans, increased anti-money laundering efforts by governments and banks, and the exposure of vast corruption networks around the world. The report we're discussing today, while it's focused on North Korean actors, exemplifies the type of change we're hoping to see in the DRC, which includes increased attention to illicit actors abusing the country's financial system, stricter enforcement of existing laws and regulations, and the need for technical assistance so that the DRC's banks and public institutions are better able to prevent, detect, and punish illicit financial activity. I will now turn it over to John Deloso, the Century Senior Investigator, for an overview of the report. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, the findings in this relatively short report are relevant for policymakers, researchers, bankers, and the broader public. And while the report most specifically pertains to North Korea and the DRC, the implications and insights will be more widely instructive on sanctions evasion, sanctions enforcement, due diligence by banks, and overall financial inclusion. So. Uh, with that said, I'm going to briefly review the report and then hopefully turn it over as quickly as possible to this uh, esteemed panel so we can start discussing the report and putting it into context. So for those of you who have not read the report, there are two primary factual takeaways from this uh, report, though there are clearly much broader ramifications, as I said. First, North Korean businessmen set up a company in the DRC, opened a bank account, and won public contracts. 
Stemming from that, these commercial activities constitute apparent violations of EU, UN, and US sanctions. So let's go into that first point a little bit more. What happened? So two businessmen came to the DRC in 2018 on North Korean passports and using tourist visas. And you should see the travel documents they used up on your screen now. So these two individuals, Mr. Wang Kilsu and Pak Wasong, once they entered the country, quickly set up a business by the name of Congo Akonde. And uh, you'll see some of the incorporation documents on your screen now, clearly identify these individuals as having been born in Pyongyang, even if the specific description of their nationality is somewhat ambiguous. And then very importantly, as part of the company formation process, these individuals opened up a US dollar bank account with little apparent resistance at the DRC affiliate of a bank uh, called Afriland First Bank. And notably within no more than three months of setting up the company, Congo Aconde, these individuals won contracts from the provincial government in a very isolated area of the country to build two statues. And mind you, for those of you who are North Korea experts, this was in 2018. Then after this, uh, what I would call fairly rapid feat of business development, these, the company showed up later on the other side of the country. Now we're, the statues were built in the Southeast and now we're in the Northwest in Kinshasa. And we saw one of the shareholders in the company, a North Korean national, appear at a public event speaking with the governor of the province that encompasses Kinshasa and who also happens to be a senior uh, member of the former president's political party. So there are some sanctions implications here, as I noted. EU, UN, and US sanctions largely forbid the provision of banking services to North Koreans. And in this case, we see that the North Koreans were able to obtain such services. Notably, US sanctions strictly prohibit provision of US dollar accounts to North Koreans. And again, in this case, we see that the North Koreans were able to obtain such accounts. Finally, EU and UN sanctions expressly prohibit the procurement of North Korean origin statues, as well as prohibiting member state entities, UN member state entities, from procuring statues from North Koreans. So in this case, we have North Koreans building statues, which they are not, uh, in, uh, not allowed to do according to current EU and UN sanctions regimes. And then we have provincial authorities in this far-flung province by the name of Olumami using public funds to pay for those statues. So this is a, what you call a, a apparent bi-directional violation of those sanctions programs, both by the North Koreans and the people who had dealings with them. So I wanna end on why this matters because some of you have expertise in North Korea and not the DRC and vice versa. So I just wanna spell this out. Sanctions on North Korea aim to disrupt uh, in large part, overseas revenue generating activities and access to banking services, which is precisely what we see happen here. Um, these individuals engaged in both of those activities and obtained access to those services. And that is, these sanctions exist because they're targeting revenue gen generated overseas because that may, that revenue may support the primary target of sanctions on North Korea, and that would be their weapons programs. And beyond specifically the threats uh, touching on North Korea, there are also there are systemic vulnerabilities in the DRC within public institutions and private institutions such as banks that really gave rise to this uh, scenario that we're discussing today. And far from just being damaging to the reputations of those institutions or revealing of certain institutional frailties, this puts the entire Congolese economy in danger. As you'll hear, on this panel, the economy of the Democratic Republic of Congo is heavily dollarized. And as a result, banks in the DRC rely on international banks to process transactions in foreign currencies, uh, but with particular importance on the US dollar. So these kinds of activities obviously make international banks take pause. And in fact, this would not be the first time international banks uh, have come face to face with sanctions evasion issues or other uh, matters pertaining to illicit finance in the DRC. So this seemingly peripheral and arcane history we've written about with small, not particularly uh, appealing statues in a far-flung province is actually quite important from the perspective of international peace and security, as Brownman said, and also 
the economic well-being of the Congolese public, which should be a major preoccupation of ours in this matter. So with that, I would like to turn it over to um, uh, Hillary, I believe. All right, I'm going to jump in. Uh, again, my name is Bronwyn Bruton, the Director of Programs and Studies at the Africa Center. I have the honor of moderating this panel. Thank you so much for those remarks, John. You were true to your word. You gave it to us in a nutshell. Um, I'm going to turn to Daria Dolzakova first. Um, Daria, I am not an expert in proliferation financing, so I have to tell you um, I'm a little confused about why we have so many people assembled here um, expressing concern about these statues in the Congo. Um, can you explain to a non-expert like me how we know for sure that these aren't sort of two guys from a difficult country just trying to make a living somewhere? Sure, yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, the most simple answer to that is we don't really know <laughs> that there aren't, but the chances are very, very slim that they are. Um, so when we talk about proliferation financing, just to sort of give a 101 to folks who might not be familiar with what we're talking about when we talk about proliferation finance or PF, a lot of times kind of when you say PF, people think exchange of funds for weapons of mass destruction. And that's part of it. That is a very, very small part of what PF actually looks like. A large part of PF um, that we see actually looks at these kind of revenue generating activities by proliferators or the establishment and use of these kind of financial and corporate networks that were highlighted, some of them in this case study, to move the funds that are generated uh, back to these proliferating countries and potentially to contribute to their WMD programs. Now, how we draw that link from North Korea's WMD program to the construction of these two statues, that's sort of where the challenge lies. And that's a, that's a challenge that a lot of people looking at proliferation financing at North Korean sanctions evasion actually face. Um, because a lot of times we can't make that connection. Um, in some instances, North Korean construction activity in Africa that has been linked to particular companies. Um, so I'm thinking of Malaysia Korea Partners, um, for instance, or um, MLP, Mansuday, um, the Mansuday Group there have been links made directly to the North Korean government. So whenever we see links to those companies, it's a pretty safe bet that, you know, they're operating on behest of the North Korean government. In instances like this one, where there's not as clear of a connection to one of these entities, it does become a little bit trickier to make that connection. However, looking at these two individuals, um, and knowing the way that the North Korean economy works and how closely North Korean activities abroad are monitored by the government. Um, and the fact that these are actually, they're small statues, but they're relatively substantial sort of investments uh, or, or projects for uh, a country like North Korea that is under quite significant sanctions. So we're not talking about the smuggling of, you know, a couple of packs of cigarettes. Um, these, these are construction projects that will generate some revenue. Um, so the chances of these two guys just kind of going off on their own, um, I would say are very slim. Right, thank you for that, Daria, appreciate it. Um, John, let me jump to you for just half a second. Do you have any sense of the dollar amounts involved in this transaction? Uh, I would say we don't. Um, that was obviously something we tried to establish through our investigation, but in the end, uh, we were not able to establish that. Um, if I could jump back to one quick point uh, to reinforce what Daria said, um, for those of you who've read the, the end notes of the report, you will have most likely seen that one of the um, initial end notes references the passports and the type of passports these individuals were carrying. Uh, we had a, a bit of a um, mixed bag, I would say, of input from North Korea experts and people had some knowledge of North Korean travel documents, but there is reason to suspect that a PO passport, which is the type these two individuals were carrying, is in fact an official passport, which the UN uh, panel of experts in the DPRK indicates are given to professional athletes going overseas and state-owned company employees who have been set on a, sent on an official mission abroad. Thank you. Great. Thank you, John. That's, that is also a helpful clarification. I appreciate that. Um, Pierre Engelbert. So you know DRC inside and out. You've traveled through the country for years and years and years and years. You've actually seen these statues, unbeknownst uh, to you, um, that they were they were North Korean um, financing efforts. What is your take on this situation? I mean, what's your reaction to the fact that these were apparently um, 
connected to the North Korean regime. And do you think that this is an example of, of Congolese corruption or are we more likely looking at a situation of incompetence on the Congolese side? Thank you, Bronwyn. Uh, th yeah, th those are good questions. Let me clarify, I was in 2018 in Kamina for, for my own research. I had nothing to do with this. And I did see at the time uh, the first statue. Uh, uh, this, this, the statue, the report doesn't fully clarify it, but the first statue is a statue of the founder of the Luba Empire. It's uh, Ilunga Mbidikiluwe. And so he's the you know, mythical person, a, a hunter who's at the origin of the, the Luba. Luba is the largest ethnic group in Congo, although they're only 8% of the country. They're the largest single ethnic group and they're a complete majority in that province. Now they had that, they had that statue there and we saw it. I didn't know the Koreans were, were, the North Koreans were building it, but there was an issue. They were waiting, it was before the presidential elections and they were waiting for the candidate uh, the, uh, of the regime, uh, 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 Emmanuel Shadari, to come and visit and campaign. But apparently he wasn't coming, and this is the story that the locals told me, uh, because they were expecting the statue of Kabila and, and not a statue of the founding uh, father of the empire. And so then that might explain, when I was there, the second statue wasn't there. And so apparently they also ordered a second statue of the father, not, not the current Kabila present, but the, the, the previous one, who uh, is a Luba himself, although not from that province, uh, but he's a he's part of that group. Um, this was the only public investment I was able to observe there. So this is a very poor province, one of the poorest uh, in the country, one of the, the few that doesn't have significant mineral resources. And I, that's one of the things we asked the governor, and we met with the governors, like, given the scarcity of resources, is it really meaningful to um, use the little money you have uh, uh, to build uh, statues of, of uh, uh, the founding father and, and, and the president? Now, I'll tell you what, to some extent, it, it was meaningful um, politically. And so this uh, kind of goes with your question of competence and, and corruption. There's no lack of individual competence in Congo. The, the public administrators or the, the bankers are, are, are highly educated and competent people. But it's a very corrupt institutional environment. And it's an institutional environment where you need to secure patronage. You cannot function unless you have some sort of godfather, some patron looking after you. And that is true for provincial governors. So you have the governor of that, that region, which has virtually no local resource. And like Okatanga, for example, where they can tax mining. Here, there really is nothing. And so they're very dependent on Kinshasa to transfer resources. And the, the constitution uh, uh, ob obligates the central government to transfer 40% of national revenue to province. They don't in reality, it's more like 5%. So you need to go and lobby and you need to do things that please the government. And that could be giving ministers or, or important people access to, to contracts, to resources. Or if you can a province like Olomami that really has so little, it might be building a statue and, and, and making them happy and showing your allegiance that way. Right? So to some extent, I can see how that might have been a rational decision for the governor. And then the statue of the, of the founding father of the empire might have been due to the fact that there was significant division among the provincial population, all of whom are Lubakat, but they come from different, let's say, clan to, to simplify. And right before this gentleman became the governor, the previous governor had been destituted because he was uh, believed by some members of the provincial assembly of not representing a significant important branch of the, of the lineage. And so I think there was an attempt here to bring the Lubakat together. Now I can tell you that for people who deal with this kind of, of uh, uh, political constraint, Following UN sanction is really a mild priority. It, you know, they might they might be aware of it, but frankly, that that ranks very low on the totem pole of, of political obligation and political survival and, and financial survival come first in Congo for them. Yeah, I imagine they must be very surprised indeed. Uh, the people of Kamina to know that we're all here talking about those statues today. <laughs> so let me pick up on one point that you made, Pierre, um, and take that back to John. Pierre mentioned that this is something that was likely to need involvement by Kinshasa. And you mentioned in your report that some of these businessmen had actually had been seen with associates of, of then President Kabila. Is that correct? That is correct. The three uh, senior political figures in the elected officials in the country uh, with whom the North Koreans had some level of interaction or, or the, the politicians who were apparently aware of the projects that they were undertaking. Um, all three of them fall under the, the grouping, uh, the electoral bloc that is um, headed by former President Joseph Kabila, the FCC, or Common Front for Congo. 
And then two of those individuals are quite senior in Kabila's uh, political party itself, which is the PPRD. So while uh, Emmanuel Shadari, the, the political candidate that uh, Pierre mentioned, we don't have any evidence that the, he came uh, in direct contact with these North Koreans, you know, shook their hands, knew that the, the this specific company was building the statues. But as we know in the report, he did say that he visited this uh, site of these statues because it constituted a promise of the head of state to the people of the region. So we took that to be at the minimum an indicator that this was a project of some import. Then later uh, we identified the fact that one of the North Korean officials, or pardon me, North Korean um, uh, shareholders came in direct contact with the governor of Kinshasa province by the name of uh, Gobila and was having a conversation with him, was apparently a pitching a some sort of uh, public park project with a fairly large price tag from what we've been able to determine, though not conclusively. Um, so the, the question for me becomes, how do these individuals who just recently entered in the country establish business in, sh in such short order, and then on top of that establish business in these far-flung places in the case of Kamina, but projects that ga gain the attention of people who are at the, the highest rungs of authority in the country? Excellent. Thank you very much, John. Um, Flora Bear Anzaluni, let me turn to you because you, you're an expert in the Congolese banking system. You've been employed by the major um, banking conglomerates uh, in Africa, so you, you are a senior official yourself. Tell me, what, uh, what went wrong here? What, what, what is the state of the Congolese banking system, if you could characterize it broadly? And then specifically, what failed? in order for this to happen. Is this a big mistake? Is this an easy mistake? Try to give us some sense of, of how, how big of an oops this was. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to say that as a former banker and a civil society activist, I'm clearly not surprised by the, the content of the, of the report. Um, uh, as Mr. Engelberg just said, it's clearly a systemic uh, problem. It's not only this one. It's, it's the consequence of, of the systemic problem that the country is facing, which includes bad governance and, of course, corruption. So, um, as briefly indicated by John, uh, I think, yeah, uh, uh, this environment is quite particular because the value of our currency is, is too, too low uh, uh, and that is its weight. And most of transactions are currently carried out in US dollar. This is the first thing. Uh, therefore, we are really very de uh, depending on the international uh, financial networks. Secondly, in addition, most of products and goods are imported. So that's why this situation is very important for us uh, as civil society members. And we are supporting uh, the conclusion of this report. I'd like to, to, to insist. We'll Push for for the recommendations to be implemented, but unfortunately, the way the DRC banking sector is working as of today is to some extent dangerous for DRC and especially for global financial system. Let me explain. Let me give you an example. Uh, one of the best, the the the, the, the most the, the, the issue is the central bank himself. The existing banking control system is really weak but also corrupt and, uh, and the general, uh, by the general political uh, system. So the compliance system is not appropriate. As an example, the cash withdrawals and deposit limits uh, are officially 10,000 US dollar. This is a, a way to, to control uh, the way the, the, the cash is, uh, is moving. But when you see what is happening, Banks uh, and, and officially, uh, banks need to get a special authorization to exceed this uh, uh, this requirement. But what you are seeing uh, uh, from today, all banks are not respected. Uh, clearly, not respected this very important requirement. And unfortunately, even the central bank itself is breaking the rules by making large cash disbursements, as it was the case. I don't know if you follow what happened with the the head of cabinet of the president, which is actually uh, at the court. But one of the problem, one of the issue uh, that has been raised is the fact that the central banks give, withdraw millions of 
Torah in cash and, and give them to, uh, uh, to, to the, the last beneficiaries. So in resume, in, in central, the central bank management himself is really politicized and is one of, it's one of the, 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 the issues that we are facing. So I, I, I will give you other examples, but let's, let's talk and I will give some, some other points and issues. That's, thank you so much. That's really good. Awesome. Um, let, well, let me ask you, I mean, one of the things that we sort of started talking a little bit about uh, in, in one of our pre-conversations on this event, we were trying to figure out who is responsible for okaying an account like this. I mean, as, as an average citizen, I have to say, I don't encounter North Korean individuals very often. If one of them came up to me and said, hey, I'd like to do some business with you, I would probably know myself. That's not a good idea. So what, it, it, is there a person in the Congolese banking system who's supposed to put a stamp on a document to say, yes, you can open an account? Yeah, of course. The, the, the governor of the central bank is the one who is responsible of, the, uh, of, this, of this situation. But at the same time, let, let me explain another very important point. We uh, as country, we have a very big issue in the identifications of, of, of people. Um, let's say it's too that difficult, uh, and even not, not, I can even say uh, not, uh, I can even say impossible for a bank to be able to truly identify a customer. I don't want to justify what, what happened, but this is one of the issues that we have. We are probably one of the only uh, country in the, around the world uh, that de currently doesn't have any national ID. We don't have any national ID since 20, more than 20, uh, 20 years. So banks are used some other documents uh, generally unreliable, unreliable and for which the possibility of verifying the originality is almost uh, uh, not possible. So you, they can use voter card, certificate of loss, uh, driver license, but all those documents uh, uh, are available on the, let's say, the parallel uh, market to the to, the, to a, a very ridiculous uh, fees. So this is a very a fundamental uh, issue uh, that is actually making the requirement of KYC, know your customer, extremely difficult. And of course, this is also impacting the creation and, and identification of local businesses, because if you cannot identif identify the persons, so how could you be able to identify uh, 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 the business who, that are run by, by, by person? So uh, the DRC is also one of the, let's say, the, the few countries where, where, where a non-resident can open and hold an account without a, a rigorous uh, control. So the, the central bank is the one responsible. Thank you. Let, let me ask Pierre to jump in on this. Thank you. I'd like to add a few things to really complement what Floribert is saying. Um, you know, in Congo, you have on paper, you have all the checks and balances and you have the transparency requirements and you have institutions. So for example, there's a national cell for financial intelligence. There's an anti-corruption uh, agency. There's all these things. The government sets them up often under pressure from donors and then uh, uh, applies itself to essentially neutralize them either by not by not funding them or by finding ways to bypass them. Right. And so that's really how, how Congo functions. You have a formal institutional setup, but you have a very strong shadow uh, mode of governance, uh, which is not always visible. So, for example, you would have a bank and it would be, imagine that, I don't know the specifics, but imagine the, the branch of Afriland in Lubumbashi, where these two gentlemen established their account. The way it would work typically in Congo is that, you know, you have the agency, the branch there, there's a bunch of people waiting for normal business, and then a big man would come in, somebody with influence. And that person would immediately go to the back room and meet with the, the branch manager. And, and then they would, they would work things out, they would hug each other, there would be all sorts of, you know, casual conversation. And then he would say, listen, I need you to do me a favor. And, and there's these two people here. We need to open an account. It's not up to the manager to really fight this. This person will have significant connection. It could be the end of the manager's career. And so you will work with this. And this is really the kind of environment. Again, I don't know the specific, but to me, it seems very plausible that one would not be at liberty to really enforce regulations in this kind of high pressure political environment. Thanks very much, Pierre. I mean, I. 
I think one of the major questions that we should really try to get to during this conversation is the extent the the question of culpability, because obviously, you know, this is two North Korean businessmen, but the kind of activities that we're talking about is, as you pointed out in your remarks, John, could have a tremendous impact on the willingness of banks to do business in the Congo, on the ability of the Congolese people to exercise you know, their, their economic freedoms and rights. Um, and so I, I want to be really clear. Um, you know, that, that we have to sort of get to the bottom of how this could have happened and, and have recommendations that are, are both actionable for policymakers, but fair to the Congolese people as well. Um, Pierre, are you aware of any um, any outrage in Congo over this this incident? Is it is it even in Kinshasa? Is it even sort of causing a ripple thus far? I'm, I'm not aware of anything. I was not aware of it until I read the report. Um, and I reached out after reading the report in preparation for this meeting, I reached out to uh, colleagues uh, in, in Lubumbashi with whom I had gone to Kamina, uh, uh, Congolese colleagues with whom I do, I do research. And uh, we kind of tried to reminisce about what we knew, but he was not at all, they were not at all aware of, um, of uh, Korean dimension of the, the, uh, the international interest in this. So um, it could be a separate world. So, I mean, I want to shift back to John and to Daria as well. I mean, to try to get a sense of a little bit more context. And we've had some questions in the in the Q and A function, which I again invite everyone to use. That are talking about past North Korean activities in the DRC. Um, if Daria or John, if you could jump in, um, I know the report mentions uh, it alludes to a couple of incidents involving weapons and police in DRC. And then Daria, if you could let us know. I mean, on the scale of one to ten in terms of, of things that you've seen and would be concerned about. If you could maybe give us a number about where this ranks, I would appreciate that too. Yeah, so I think your final point actually touches on um, a couple of really interesting things that sort of link to the larger conversation that we were having about why should, and there were a couple of questions in the Q&A that, that I saw um, about, you know, why should the DRC care about this? Why should we care about this? Aren't there more important cases? Um, how large is this really? And I mean, that's something that's really tricky when it comes to looking at this from a proliferation financing perspective. So that's kind of the angle that I'm coming at it um, with is, you know, how important is this really to North Korea's weapons of mass destruction program? Again, just coming at it from a proliferation perspective. And that's really, really hard to gauge just because, again, we don't know how much money was made off of this. We don't know where that money is going to go, how much of it is actually going to go into the weapons of mass destruction um, program. But something that's really important to actually try to tackle is specifically that question is why should we care? So it's the question of what are the consequences of these kinds of sanctions evasion activities? Because, you know, as a couple of people pointed out, I think in, in the Q&A, um, there are so many, well, in, in, in this discussion, there are so many other challenges um, that the DRC and that a lot of other countries in the region are facing. So, you know, why should sanctions evasion proliferation financing and North Korean statue building really be a concern? And I think answering that question, addressing it effectively, meaningfully is actually a really important exercise, although a challenging one. And I think a few folks have touched on this already, but you know, looking at what impact does this have on the willingness of other countries and other banks to do business with the DRC? What reputational impacts does this have on the DRC economy as a whole? Those are consequences, right? What does this have? What impact does this have on safety, security um, within the country? So we need to look at consequences for proliferation financing, but also for sanctions evasion in the North Korean um, sort of context more broadly. From, from that perspective, that the consequences are kind of a lot larger than just contributing to the weapons of mass destruction program. Um, and then the other point that I wanted to make is that um, this story we hear a lot of times in a lot of different countries, um, you know, the fact that the regulation is there on paper, uh, but it's not very effective. And that's why, you know, when the Financial Action Task Force um, looks at countries and their effectiveness um, and their ability to implement UN sanctions, they look at, okay, is the regulation there, but also is it being implemented effectively? Um, so it's sort of, it's, it's a double-sided coin. You need to look at the regulation, the letter of the law, but also the political will, whether it's there or not. Um, and the fact that the political will is not there to implement sanctions or the regulation or the capability in government or the private sector is not there to implement sanctions, 
actually indicates a much larger problem that again, a lot of people have touched upon. So whenever we see gaps in proliferation financing or sanctions evasion measures, they point to other gaps like difficulty in recognizing ultimate beneficial owners like Flora Bear mentioned, which again has implications for corruption, for terrorist financing, potentially for money laundering. So you really need to look at this small case, seemingly a relatively small case of these two smaller statues. You need to look at it in this larger, more holistic context. What does this actually mean for the health of the DRC economy, for their ability to counter other forms of financial crime? Fantastic, Daria. Thank you very much. We're getting a number of questions in the in the Q and A about the uh, from uh, from various people about the ability of the Congolese government to collaborate with the UN um, on on these these sanctions and enforcing these sanctions. And uh, former Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs Hank Cohen actually asked. South Korea has an embassy in Kinshasa. Can't they help a little bit to try to identify some of these North Korean activities? Um, Pierre, John, Daria, and Flora Bear, especially. I mean, is there collaboration um, among these these various uh, Congolese entities, or is is everyone sort of asleep at the switch? And anyone can jump in. It's not very helpful for me, the moderator, to sort of say everyone. So I will call on. I, I will point someone out if need be. I'll, I'll jump in for a second. Here, <laughs> <Parker. laughs> yeah. um, I'll let someone else speak on whether the Congolese authorities are cooperating or not. But um, it does bring up the interesting point that um, it's great that there's a financial intelligence unit and an anti-corruption agency, and you know, ten other, fifteen other agencies that look at financial crime. Uh, but at the end of the day, again, when we're talking about sanctions evasion specifically which one of them, where does the bug stop? Which one of them is actually responsible for, for regulating the private sector, for enforcing sanctions, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of times um, that can actually be to the detriment of proliferation, countering proliferation financing or sanctions evasion when you kind of have too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, so it's not a matter of kind of quantity, but more of quality, I guess, or identifying who is actually responsible for keeping track of all of this and, and uh, being accountable for all of this. Flora Bear, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah. See? Yes, uh, I'm not sure because the, let me say that the, the Congolese authorities are part of the problem. Uh, I can even say that they are the main problem. Uh, and because when you see uh, the people involved in this kind of transactions, uh, you can see uh, people from, you can see authorities or network of authorities involved in, in this kind of, uh, of transaction. As I think even in the report, you can see that Ramazani Shadai, who was the candidate of Kabila, uh, uh, is one of the person seems to be involved and others. So as of today, um, I'm not sure that they will be able to collaborate. Maybe uh, uh, the new president could be open uh, for this kind of collaboration, but I'm, I'm not sure. I would like also to react uh, quickly, uh, please, because I think it's important. One of the points raised by uh, Mr. Engelberg, regarding the fact that we have um, all the competencies and rules, and the problem is just, uh, let's say, the, the system. I can say yes, 80% uh, of the problem is the system. But I think we also have some technical issues in, in the banks uh, themselves. Um, when you say, in, you see in most of banks in the DRC, anti-money laundering systems and monitoring of the accounts, uh, let's say, of, for example, political figures, are clearly not uh, not existent. This is an issue. Uh, the alert and monitoring tools are very, very weak. I've spent 10 years in, in two banks, four years as a, as a risk manager, and I tell you, I can tell you that it's weak. And in most uh, in, in most cases, manual it's manual. So there is current there is currently no centralized database. Uh, uh, that can be access for everybody. So how do you want the bank to be able to, uh, to control all those things if you don't have all those tools? And also let me say about the employees. Uh, 
and uh, I'm really objective. Uh, regarding the AML risk, I, 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 I'm not sure that the, the level of, um, of knowledge uh, is enough. Uh, the most exposed employees are clearly not enough trained on uh, AML uh, risk. So I think we have a systemic issue, but banks need also uh, to do what they have to do. And at the end of the day, the responsible again is the central bank because the central bank is the one who is supposed to control and to be sure that all those things are put in place in all the banks. Thanks very much, Flor Baron. Appreciate that. Um, so we, um, probably not surprisingly, have a question from an eagle-eyed observer in the audience who not coincidentally is a member of the UN panel of experts on the DPRK, who uh, looked at the passports of the two North Korean um, businessmen who allegedly um, are implicated in this and noticed that they were both uh, issued, both passports issued in July of 2014. Um, this observer says that that's unlikely to have been a coincidence and asks whether, I think this question will go to you, John, um, whether you were able to find any um, evidence that they were active in either in DRC or in other African countries, because this uh, expert feels that it's unlikely that this is the first time that they were, um, that they were active on the continent if the passports are years and years old. Great. Yeah, it's a wonderful question. I'll just say at the outset, I would certainly welcome an offline conversation uh, with said expert to discuss the matter and perhaps educate myself. Uh, we know, as we say in the report, that these individuals obtained their visas at the DRC embassy in Yaoundé, Cameroon. Um, curiously, there are similarly similar visa requirements for DPRK citizens in Cameroon as in DRC. So I think that would serve to reinforce the experts observation that, that perhaps we're looking at people who have been in the region, um, at least to some degree. Um, we don't really have a clear sense of what they might have been doing. Um, but without making any promises, of course, I would say that that's something we remain keenly interested in. And um, we would certainly uh, hope to, to find such information at some point. Thanks, John. I, I hope that uh, I hope that the expert who sent in that question will please put their email uh, in the Q and A function, and we'll make sure to connect you uh, with the Sentry for that um, very interesting conversation that I wish I could hear. <laughs> um, so, look, a lot of a lot of the questions that we're getting in are are focused on what is is probably the biggest issue that we're talking about here. I mean, obviously, um, the need to to ensure that North Korea doesn't get financing for its its nuclear efforts is important. But there's another issue of the Congo and the consequences for the Congo um, uh, that are likely to be rained down as a result of, of this report. How can we um, ethically, without frightening international banks away from the Congo start to take action to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Um, the issue of, of de-risking is important, but it often drives banks out of the DRC. And, and one of our commentators has actually noted that there's been a 20% decrease in the number of banks willing to do business um, in DRC in recent years as a result of these concerns. So John, do you want to give us a quick overview of what you think government should be doing and if Daria Pierre Fleur-Bert can can help us to ground truth those that would be very helpful as well. Absolutely I'll, I'll do my best to summarize the um, recommendations but I will say that Hillary Mossberg who's on the line is probably more competent to discuss those as our illicit finance policy director but uh, I'll just say at, at the outset that our objective is not necessarily punitive in writing this kind of report. It's to identify a, a, a vulnerability or a weakness and give constructive options for or, or recommendations for addressing those weaknesses. Um, we, of course, would want authorities to be aware of these two specific individuals, but the broader objective is to reinforce or give some means of, uh, to the, the local authorities, other authorities, to, to reinforce their capacity. Um, I, I hate to turn it over to Hillary, but perhaps you'd be willing to just give a, a really quick overview of uh, what we've recommended. 
Yeah, I mean, and Hillary, I mean, what I would say is that we all, I think, not me personally, since I'm not an expert in this, but I think that the proliferation experts in the room are going to have their their standard lists of, of best practices. And it's fairly easy to sort of say, these this is what they should be doing, and this is what they're not doing. But I think we, we've got enough really expert people in the room, and Pierre in, in particular, and Floribert in particular, who can say, what's realistic in the DRC context? I mean, obviously, we can we can sort of criticize their lack of, of regulations and their their openness to corruption. But if you had you know two or three suggestions of what what can really be done in the short term to make this less likely to happen again, what's what's your sense of that? Thanks. So that's a really great question. Um, so there's there are a couple of things uh, that we think would be relatively simple and feasible uh, uh, from both the banking sector and the Congolese government. Um, on the government side, they have most of the laws and regulations and policies are in place. They're just not enforced. So you have a banking supervision office uh, at the central bank that is supposed to be uh, supervising these banks and ensuring they are following the written protocols for anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism regime uh, that is in place in the, in the country. They're just not following up. If that office needs perhaps more funding or more technical assistance, those would be relatively easy fixes to take um, that would ensure that the government is keeping an eye on which banks are doing their, the due diligence they need to do and which banks are not. On the banking side, um, there is a, you know, the Congolese Banking Association is a very active group um, and they are, we think they're, you know, so, so Affluent First Bank is not a, is, is actually headquartered in Cameroon. Uh, it's not a Congo, it's a branch um, uh, that's that's in Congo. Um, but any bank operating in Congo needs to uh, beef up their AML-CFT uh, regime and needs to know what risks are out there. Um, each bank needs to take its own risk assessment, you know, taking a look at which clients they have, what they're comfortable, what, what type of risk they're com comfortable taking on, and uh, using the risk assessment, um, uh, set up their own internal controls to make sure that situations like this don't, don't happen in the future. Um, with, the, with North Korea, it's, it's, it's a training, so, you know, they, every banking employee at Afroland uh, needs to go through training um, on UN sanctions in particular. Um, and I, that's a relatively easy, that's a relatively easy fix and feasible. Uh, and I think with, with those two things, both on the government side and the private sector side working together, um, you could see some pretty marked improvement um, very quickly. Thanks very much for that. Floor Bear, Pierre, do you want to respond? I mean, Pierre, you've mentioned, for example, that there's not there's not a huge amount of attention to the sanctions issue. Do you recommend punitive measures for specific individuals? I mean, what, what can be done to make this sort of be taken more seriously? Yeah, th thank you. That's a, it's a great question. I was going to say the many Congolese elites are under sanctions themselves. And so you can say punitive sanctions, but you know, join the club. So you know, the, we, we have this interesting uh, arrangement in Congo where there's a there's a formal president who was never elected, but you know, is 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 there through some uh, again a shadowy deal, and then you have uh, Kabila who, re who retained significant power, uh, control the, the the national assembly, control many institutions, control many governors, and 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 people around Kabila, there's a lot of them, politicians and the top military brass are under U.S. and in EU sanctions. So there might be a degree of of solidarity among among sanctionees there saying you know hey sanction busting is is is, uh, is a way of living right so uh so i'll say that uh, i just want to say that bank fraud is a is a huge thing in congo there were, a few years ago there was a report by a congolese um i can't remember his name uh but he, he had been working in the bank and he, he was able to document a lot of uh, transaction on behalf of the Kabila regime that were fraudulent and he released a report about that and, and so this has been out there you know, this is a different story, but this kind of practice uh, uh, has been documented by, by including by Congolese um, uh, uh, members of the banking sector. Um, uh, but let me add one one final point, which is an anecdotal one, but will, which will illustrate the kind of issues you have in the banking sector. In 2016, the governor of Okatanga, a province next to, not too far from Olomami, but much richer province with a lot of banking, a lot of mining uh, activity, the governor Jean-Claude Kazembe, 
was collected tax from a from a, a mining company and it turned out there was 23 million dollars and then he placed it in a private account of his and when he was questioned by the provincial assembly he said you know it's in dollars and the 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 the, government, the, the, the provinces account is in congolese francs so i put it there for safekeeping in my own dollar denominated account now, I don't think he would have got in trouble if he had been more generous in sharing this, but then a lot of the members of the provincial assembly accused him of what, you know, what the Congolese would say is he was eating alone. He was enjoying the benefits of that by himself. And so then he was, he was impeached uh, in the provincial assembly and was, and was dismissed. Then he lost control of that money. So even though he put that in a, in a dollar denominated account that, that supposedly he was in control of, then Kabila sent people down and somehow the money escaped him. And when I interviewed him and I met him, he said, you know, it, w it went up to Kinshasa. And when I asked what's going on with him, they told me we are saving it and we will, you know, for some, for some later day. Meanwhile, the money disappeared. This was like two, three years later. And he said, we were unable to, to trace this. And he was no longer governor. Wow. So, so when you think of the, the, the Koreans opening an account with $10,000, it doesn't look like it's much. But once you have an account like this, God knows what kind of transactions can happen through it. And, and there would be very little oversight if you have the right politicians with you. Thank you, Pierre. That's a great point. Flora Bear, did you want to add anything on there? Yes, of course. Um, just wanted to say that applying sanctions, I think it's not the final uh, solution. It's a way to reduce maybe the, the level of uh, bad things uh, happening, but it's not the, 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 solution, the final solution. The final solution uh, cannot be achieved if the government and the authorities are not involved. This is the main issue that we have. We need to have a leadership that is taking care of those issues. This is the main problem. As of today, we have leaders that, that are involved in, in that problem. And we were maybe thinking that President Chisekedi will make it different. Let's see. But normally, uh, we need to have leadership that will take care of that. And if you have this kind of leadership, they will reinforce even the, the, the institutions that are currently existing. Let's give a, a quick example. There is a National Financial uh, Intelligence Unit. I think, again, Mr. Engelberg talked about it. Uh, this institution is placed under the supervision of the Ministry of Finance. And the mission is to fight against money laundering, money laundering and the financing of terrorism. terrorism. But it's really the, the, the real power of, of, of this institution is limited uh, only because uh, 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 it's not enough autonomous. This is one of the issues that, uh, that, that, that you have. Uh, the other problem is because the political, the, the largely, the, the political uh, 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 actors and the public actors are concerned by the mission of this structure. And at the same time, is put under the control of the Ministry of the Finance. So you can see this, those kind of um, things that can uh, completely uh, uh, not help uh, resolve this kind of issue. So I think we need to have in the TRC a leadership that is taking care of these issues. This is the only thing that I can I can say. This is the, the, the way, the only way, in my opinion, that help us find the, the, uh, help us resolve those issues. Thank you, Flora Bear. Much appreciated. So, Daria, let me let me ask you. I mean, you you follow North Korea. You sort of know the the mo uh, of actors like these two North Korean businessmen. So I, I'd like your thoughts about what. Um, next steps should be, and, and in particular, uh, in light of the fact that this may have been some kind of a probing exercise, uh, the first of, of many efforts um, by these two individuals to try to start moving money. So what, what would you do next? Yeah, um, so a couple of things. Um, I mean, whether or not it's a probing exercise, um, hard to say, as somebody had pointed out. There have been activities in DRC by North Korea previously, um, so they have already probed, um, but you know potentially 
Um, you know, there, there's plenty of other opportunities to make money in the DRC. Um, you know, North Korea might continue to take advantage of those. Um, but a lot of these challenges that we've talked about in the DRC when it comes to sanctions evasion and countering proliferation financing, as I've said before, are issues that we've come across in a lot of other jurisdictions. And, um, and it is a combination of, you know, sometimes lack of political will, corruption, but also lack of regulation kind of on paper. Um, so kind of caveating with the fact that I'm not familiar with DRC financial regulation and what it looks like. I think, you know, I'm a little bit biased towards countering proliferation finance specifically and focusing on that, but I think it is important to differentiate sanctions evasion in the PF context from terrorist financing and money laundering because, you know, and making sure that there are regulations in place to implement proliferation financing specific sanctions. Um, because when we look at something like the construction of statues, um, that is not an illegal activity, um, unlike, you know, money laundering, which usually has a predicate crime attached to it, um, or terrorist financing. So unless you know that that activity is being carried out by North Korea um, or by another sanctioned individual, you might not know that this is an illegal activity. Uh, so making sure that proliferation financing specific provisions are in place and regulations are in place that cover those activities that might otherwise be legal, the operation of restaurants, for instance, by North Korea is also prohibited. So making sure that all of that is integrated into regulation outside of just AML and um, terrorist financing provisions, um, that is really, really critical. Um, one point that was brought up by Flora Barra, which I've picked up on already, is uh, making available ultimate beneficial ownership information, UBO information. Um, banks need that to know who is behind these accounts. Again, if they just see someone constructing or paying for statue construction that might not send off red flags in this case we had north korean passports but you know in a lot of cases they'll use front companies or intermediaries so being able to actually identify who's behind those front companies that are building these otherwise apparently legal or engaging these otherwise apparently legal activities is really really important and again that goes back to flora bear's point on the importance of government involvement at the end of the day um, you know, the private sector can can try as hard as it will, but if this information is not made available, if they don't know what to do with it, if they don't know that they need to freeze funds, for instance, and not just close accounts and give those funds back, um, like we see sometimes, then, you know, then sort of a, a moot point if the government isn't there to kind of to, to raise that awareness. And then one final point, um, something that, again, we've seen in other jurisdictions, but this distinction between North Korea and South Korea and the lack thereof sometimes. Um, so you'll notice that on these documents and on the accounts, I think it was, or the corporate documentation, um, you know, if you don't know where Pyongyang is and you just see Korea, you don't know if it's South or North, so there's confusion. So that is actually a really simple thing that governments can do, is to ensure that on any kind of corporate documentation, you differentiate, or trade documentation, you differentiate between North and South Korea. It sounds simple, but this falls through the cracks all the time, again, as we saw in this documentation. Um, so just kind of a simple thing, some pretty low hanging fruit um, that, that can be sort of attacked. Excellent. Thanks so much. So we're, we're closing in on, on last comments, I think. I mean, I, I have a question. I don't know if I'm allowed to ask it. Um, John will probably tell me I'm not. But I'm just, you know, it, it really goes back to this idea that these are a couple of small statues in a very, very small corner of the Congo. And I'm, you know, curious about how it was that you managed to uncover this situation, John. Um, but also, if, if you're not able to answer that, maybe you can um, let us know how civil society, particularly given that Flora Bear is, is the head of a, a citizens activist network, what sort of things can civil society be on the lookout for? Um, you know, given the Congolese government is probably not, um, you know, or as, as Pierre says, is, is, is anything a little bit sympathetic to the sanctions busters um, themselves. What can civil society do to step in? Um, but what I really want to know is how you track this down. Uh, great. I'll try not to be too mysterious. Um, and I'll say I'll, I'll answer the first question to the degree I can, and then I'll um, pass on the question about civil society to, to Flory Bear as a, as a leader in um, that movement. So the best way I can put it is uh, that we became aware of a company with um, some connection to North Korea. And then we have the benefit of having an expert on North Korean uh, overseas revenue generation activity in our, um, in our organization, my uh, colleague, J.R. Maley. And 
I did not immediately recognize the importance of the fact that there was a company with a connection in North Korea. So my first thought was, hey, this is interesting and it looks like perhaps a sanctions violation, but you know, is this something I should really spend time on? And if not for his intervention, I think I probably would have gone the, the very passive route. And of course, we wouldn't be here today talking about it, which I'm, I'm certain there's some people in the audience who would prefer that. Um, and certainly some people in the DRC who would prefer that, and maybe even North Korea. So, you know, the, the special sauce of investigation, that's, that's a whole different conversation. But, you know, what we do is when we find out that the presence of activities, uh, illicit activities that have some bearing on, um, you know, the integrity of the international financial system, we go about trying to document it. Uh, and in this case, I'll say that we have looked at front companies in the past. We've looked at companies that are, um, you know, shell companies, et cetera. This one was a little bit different because these, this was a, you know, a, a pretty fleet unit of people it would seem. They were moving around the country. They didn't really leave the, the expected traces we would normally look for. Um, so a lot of what we did was trying to eke out you know, information and, and understanding of who they were and what they were doing in the margins. And you know, the level of detail in this report is fascinating to me as a, as a person who looks primarily at Africa and illicit finance and not North Korea, that the reception from North Korea watchers, if I can include you in that group, Daria, uh, was actually quite positive. Uh, whereas my experience looking at grand corruption in Africa, my thought was this: this is you know, there are so many things here we would love to answer, but but you know, you have to make the decision at some point to to publish and expose an activity that has again some sort of bearing on international peace and security and and could have ramifications for the. Um, economy. So I think I'll leave it there and perhaps pass it to Flory Bear. Thanks, Flory Bear, please. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Let's say um, as a citizen movement, um, virtually we, also, we are also, let's say, um, in some way, the voice of citizen. And we need to be sure that what is happening, the way the country is run, is in the advantage of citizens. And that's why when we get this kind of report, it's important for us to first of all to understand what happened, and then to be sure that recommendations that are made through those reports um, can be uh, can be will be implemented. Just because when we take this situation, if the let's say the the, the, the U.S. system decide to not work again with the Congolese system, the consequences will be very, very bad for the economy, for the population, and for everybody. So we have the responsibility to be sure that these kind of issues are resolved and to be also sure that what is happening, what is done, is respecting uh, rules and uh, local and international rules because our objective is to, uh, to be sure that the, the, the interest of the citizen is, is taken. Thanks so much, Flora Bear, for that comment. And um, uh, uh, we are at time, so unfortunately, we'll have to close. I think we could talk about this for a lot longer. But let me thank all of the panelists for your remarkable contributions today. It's so much appreciated. It's such a pleasure for the Africa Center to be able to convene a, a conversation that goes beyond the borders of the African nations. Um, and John, again, congratulations to you and the Century on this report. It's a really remarkable piece of detective work. Makes me wonder what else is going on in DRC that you'll be writing about next. I know you're not allowed to answer that question either, but we've had a wonderful time. So Pierre, John, Flora, Bear, Daria, and Hillary, thank you all so very much for joining us today. Thanks to everyone in the audience. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.